I grew up living with my mother and my sister. It was a fairly normal childhood, living in a small town in the UK. I never really knew my dad. All I knew from what my mother told me was that he was a very bad man. I first met him when I was around 10 years old. It was all confusing. I don't really remember everything, but I think they had started seeing each other again. They saw each other on and off for a few months, then he would disappear. This carried on throughout my teens up until I was around 15 years old. He started to get quite aggressive and she would refuse to see him anymore. My mother never told me when I was younger, but he used to beat her to within an inch of her life when she was pregnant with me. One afternoon he came to the door. When my mom would not let him in, he tried to break the door down, shouting that he was going to burn the house down and kill us all. He didn't know that I was there to witness all of this. I saw him at the front of the house with his hands to his neck, mimicking slitting our throats. The day he got arrested, my mom got a restraining order against him. That was the last time we had heard from him until three years ago. I got a postcard with nothing but my name on it and a phone number. I instantly recognized my dad's messy handwriting. I thought it was odd that after five years of no contact that I would get a postcard from him. I obviously ignored it. In July of 2013, my mother found the police at our door. They came with some news that was shocking, but also not at all. I'll start from the beginning. My grandmother went to visit my father. She is often traveling around, and it wasn't unusual not to hear from her for some weeks. But when nobody had heard anything from her for three months, the family began to worry. The last person who had seen or heard anything from her was my dad. This all happened to be around the same time I received the postcard. Her going missing had coincided with the discovery of a body around a half mile from where she was seen last. A relative identified her from a digital reconstruction of her skull, which was a striking resemblance of her. My dad was the number one suspect at this point. He was arrested on suspicion of her murder and later charged. The police took statements told us that they had found evidence and they knew it was him. My father denied everything. We were following the case, which was when all the grisly details started coming out. They had an argument and he ended up killing, dismembering, and burying her in a shallow grave. They said that she may have been still alive when he dismembered her. Strangely enough, his family were on his side and said that he was innocent. He later came clean about the whole thing. He said he thought she was a reptile in human skin and wanted to cut her open to see the reptile. He was being held in a secure psychiatric facility, but is currently in prison. He has been assessed by multiple psychiatrists who said he has paranoid schizophrenia. He was sentenced to nine years in prison for manslaughter, not murder. I find it absolutely appalling. He has served three years already, so he will be out in six years. Someone who has killed his own mother in cold blood and has made death threats to his own daughter will be out of prison so soon, and it absolutely terrifies me what could possibly happen if he ever finds me or my family. I'm confused about the postcard he sent me around the same time he killed her. I don't understand how the justice system could fuck up so much and let a potentially dangerous person out of prison so soon. I should probably also mention that he is being held in a different country from where I live, although it's very easy to cross the border. He received an extended sentence, so when he is set free, he is not allowed to travel outside the country for a further nine years. This doesn't mean he wouldn't be able to if he tried. It takes about four hours to get to where I am from where he is by train. This story is 100% true. If you don't believe me, you can Google Korstofing Hill Murder. This happened to me last summer. It was all over the news, and if I give my name, you would be able to Google me and read my testimony. But for now, I will reserve that info. Last summer, I started seeing this new girl. She was really sweet and pretty perfect. We went out and partied at the Jersey Shore the night before this happening. We didn't get home until 3 a.m. When we got home, we had a marathon of sex and didn't fall asleep until around 6.30, 7 a.m. 
It was such a great night. I was on an adrenaline high. At 11 a.m., she woke up. Saturday morning, panicked. She began to scramble and throw on clothes. I asked her what was up. Still ain't in bed. And she yells out at me. My parents are coming over at 1 p.m. My house is a mess and I have to go buy food and alcohol. I need your help. Get dressed. I slowly got up and rubbed my eyes, still feeling very alive from the night before. We got dressed, me much calmer than her, and I agreed to drive her to Walmart so she could buy everything she needed for her day with her family. When we got to Walmart, she asked me to just let her out by the front entrance and suggested I just wait in the car, as I was half asleep still and would have only slowed her down. She rushed into the store and I went to go find a parking spot. The parking lot was packed, so I parked far away by the tire shop across the lot. I texted her to let me know when she was coming out so I could pull up and pick her up where I dropped her off. As I sat in my car, slightly daydreaming about the great night I had and fantasizing about the great days to come with my new friend, I closed my eyes and recalled beginning to get into a rhythmic breathing pattern that would put even the most alert person into a state of REM sleep. I felt myself doze off and it was amazing, the air conditioning from the car gently easing me to Z-land. A few minutes later, my heart raced as I suddenly and violently was jolted from my nap. Some very sketchy looking man stood outside my passenger side window, holding a red gas can. The way he knocked on my window jarred me. I was pissed and I'm a pretty big guy at 6'5". And this creep was very tall as well, but very gaunt and slender, a lanky looking drifter who was probably the kind of scumbag that would probably take any drug you put in front of him. He motioned for me to roll my window down and stuttered at me. Hey, sir, do you think you can help me? I just, I just need a few bucks for gas. My car ran out. As I mentioned, I was pissed off he woke me up in such a fashion, so my immediate response was a dismissive and rude, no, I don't have any money. He implored me, sir, please, I'm desperate and stranded. Again, I just said no, dismissing him again and began to roll my window up. He stuck his free hand on top of the window glass, sir. Even the change in your cup holder could help me, please. I'm in a horrible situation. Realizing this guy wasn't going to leave me alone, I decided to give in and I reached into my pants pocket where I fetched out a few singles. Before I gave them to him, my friend texted me. I'm outside. Where are you? Parked by the tire shop, dealing with a homeless person begging me for money, I responded. I put up my phone and rolled the window down. The window automatically went all the way down. I reached towards the man with three dollars in my hand, and what happened next changed my life. In less than a second, I could see he was gearing up to attack me. His face got serious and he pursed his lips and gritting his teeth as he dropped the gas can and reached in with his left hand, lunging for my arm and grabbing it with all the strength in his 140 pound frail body. I tried to pull away and screamed, get the fuck off me, but he had my arm in a vice grip. With his free hand, he reached into his back pocket and pulled out a syringe which was loaded with god knows what. He turned, freeing my arm up a bit, but it was too late. He had already stuck his needle in my arm and pushed down on the plunger, releasing whatever it contained into my bloodstream. I again screamed and pulled my arm free. He pulled back and stared into my car and I screamed at him I was going to kill him. This made him even more intense as I remember him screaming, bring it on. But before I could hear what he said next, I felt my eyes go black and myself lose consciousness. I was out cold. As it turns out, I woke up several hours later in a hospital bed, my friend and my parents and brother standing over me. They rejoiced as I came to, and my mother called for the doctor and nurse. 
I asked what happened and my mother told me. Sweetheart, you were attacked. A deranged maniac stuck you with a paralyzing agent and he passed out. Jen has spotted your car and what was going on. She's the reason you're alive. She saw the man standing around the car and noticed you weren't moving. So she called 911 and luckily, there was a police officer down the street that responded in under two minutes. Jen screamed at the man that she sees him and that she called the cops and that they were on the way. He jumped into the car and tried pushing you out of the driver's seat, but before he could, the police arrived and took him down with a non-lethal taser. It turns out that he was a homeless, recently released mental patient and he intended to abduct you and God only knows what he was going to do to you next. But Jen saved your life. What a huge bombshell to drop on someone who just returned to the land of the living. Jen and I are engaged now. We plan to marry in 2016. I was 14 when this occurred, and I'm 22 now, but I still remember it in crisp detail, and it freaks me out to this day thinking what would have happened if things turned out differently. School was out for the summer, and I had convinced my mum to send me to Russia for a couple of months to visit my grandparents. Plus, I thought it would be fun being on my first trip abroad by myself. She agreed, and off I went on my first solo transatlantic journey. My grandparents are great people and have always spoiled me and my mum rotten, and they were ecstatic that their only granddaughter wanted to visit. So, they planned a little vacation of their own with me a month after I arrived, to a popular beach resort city in Turkey. We were to stay at a 5 star resort in Ankara for two weeks. I thought that was spectacular, getting to travel to not one, but two countries in one summer, and to a fancy and exotic place like Turkey too. I was dying to go. But full disclosure, when I arrived to Russia, it wasn't really what I was expecting. My grandparents are really protective people and I couldn't do much or go anywhere by myself, so it got boring pretty fast and I spent most of my days playing PSP in my room. I was also accustomed to being active and wanted to do things like go jogging, which I did every day at home, so I gave my grandparents a hard time about that since they wouldn't let me go alone and naturally, they couldn't really keep up with me. Then, after about a month, the time came to go to Turkey, and I was super excited to finally get some freedom and a change of scenery. I had been pent up at home too long. The resort they had picked was sprawled over a pretty large area. However, it was all very well secured and isolated from the rest of the city, and there was also a huge garden on the property, which was ideal for my jogging. This time, I had my own room separate from my grandparents, so I took this chance to go off by myself and explore the grounds. Most of the time, I would jog in the mornings when it was cooler with my big old iPod, so I couldn't hear anything that was going on around me, but I figured it was pretty safe, since it was a nice hotel with plenty of tourists. Then, I started to notice him. A pretty innocuous seeming gardener in his late 40s, early 50s in a green uniform. I remember he looks like a shriveled old date from too many years in the sun. He would always wave or say something in broken English as I passed by while he trimmed the shrubs or mowed the lawn. I would politely wave back, or smile or nod, but I didn't really pay much attention. Fast forward about 10 days and I was really enjoying myself. It was fun to swim in the pool and the sea. The food was great, and my grandparents had let up a lot, so I could do more by myself. However, they didn't know about my morning runs in the gardens, and I wasn't going to tell them because I wasn't sure that they would approve. So, one morning, around 7am, while I'm jogging, I see the gardener again. But this time, it's clear he's trying to get my attention. He waves at me and yells something. So I stop and pull out my earphones, trying to figure out what he wants. Now, I know he works for the hotel, so I don't really suspect anything. He waves at me again and motions me to come forward. I'm confused, but I figure he wants to tell me something, so I politely approach. He's standing at a trail that goes deeper into the gardens. He's also smiling and gesturing, and I can see he's holding something in his hand. Rosa. 
he says. Beautiful Rosa. Then, I notice he's holding a rose and extending it to me. At this point, I'm confused and a little freaked out about what the hell he's thinking. But as they put, usually, the hotel staff there are chatty, but nice enough. My grandparents would always get pulled into conversations with them about things. I figure it's something like this now, and I don't want to be rude, but still want to be on my way without offending this old man. He hands the flower to me, and I take it, thinking maybe he wants to show me some roses that are in bloom. But he keeps waving and gesturing like he wants me to follow him, and stupidly, I walk closer. He has another flower in his hand, and he backs away more. Then, suddenly he stops and starts to lower it a little. That's when I notice he's holding his other hand behind his back too, and he's holding something. I look ahead up the trail and see a little cabin type thing, where I assume they keep their gardening supplies. Something clicks in my head at that very moment and I instantly back away. He sees me do this and then tries to smile, saying, Rosa again and moves the hand he's been holding behind his back while lurching towards me. That's when I notice he's holding some kind of a rag. Without hesitation, I drop the rose he handed me, turn around and run for it at full speed. I don't stop to look back and run like mad back to the hotel. It's not until the doors close behind me and I'm among other people that I look back and see if he's followed me. I don't see him anymore and my heart is still beating like crazy. I go back to my hotel room and wait for my grandparents to wake up. I never told them any of what happened that day and spent the rest of my vacation glued to their side. I thought that if I said anything they would get even more paranoid about my safety and blame me for wandering off on my own. Also, I don't want to ruin their remaining days for them. I saw the gardener once more on the beach. I remember him talking to a security guard. I remember growing very uncomfortable and sinking into my sun chair when I saw him. Then, he looked at me and smiled. I scowled at him as he mouthed the word Rosa tauntingly and smiled again. I still remember the anger bumbling in my stomach and how much I wanted to cleave his face in, but I just froze and stared. He walked away and I went back to pretending nothing ever happened. Needless to say, I never went on any more morning jogs, and neither did I want to, until long after the summer had ended, and I'd returned back home. I work for a national, non-profit, and work remotely from my home in Michigan, but I'm sometimes asked to travel. In early July, I had to fly to DC for a series of meetings with about 10 other staff members who were all out-of-towners and would all be staying at the same hotel. While I was on the plane, I realized I forgot my cigarettes at home, and by the time I landed in Washington, hopped into a taxi to the hotel and threw my bags in the room, I was jonesing super hard. It was already late by then, almost 11 o'clock at night, and despite my better judgment, I looked on my phone for the nearest Walgreens so I could pick up a couple of packs for the week. I decided it was too late to call one of my work friends, who I knew was already in the hotel, to walk with me. And while I consider myself a fairly cautious person, and wouldn't normally go exploring an unknown neighborhood in the middle of the night, my nicotine craving went over. I headed out to the nearest drugstore, or at least the nearest my phone would pick up, which was about ten blocks away. While my hotel was situated on a busy, well-traveled street with lots of bars and restaurants, I pretty quickly realized the turn I had taken to the store put most of my trip on a much more secluded, darker stretch. I also realized just how long ten blocks actually was. Lots of boarded-up shops and homeless people lined the neighborhood. I always make a point to carry some extra cash on me when I'm in the big city to give to folks when needed. And I blew through that pretty quickly. I could feel the occasional eyes on me as I passed by, and one dude yelling something from across the street, just some standard, innocuous, how's it going, shit. All that said, the trip there was uneventful. After getting out of the store, I immediately paused out front to light up 
uh, when a guy was standing along the side of the store building. The store was right up against an alley, and he called me over. He was standing maybe seven feet away, leaning just inside the entrance of the alleyway. I ignored the first couple of hays, and started to turn to head back to my hotel in the opposite direction. But then he let out a really aggressive, Bitch, I'm talking to you! Which made me jump and instinctively whip my head around. Mistake number one, just looking in his direction, was an invitation for further interaction. His voice calmed. He asked for a cigarette and, still taken aback, I shuffled over to him in the alley where I really couldn't get a good look at him at first. I handed him a cigarette in my lighter and he asked me what a little girl like me was doing out all alone. I stammered something and he asked if I wanted to go party. <laughs> I told him no, that I need to be getting back. I remember not telling him. I remember not wanting to tell him where back was because I didn't want to reveal that. I didn't want to reveal that I was out of town and completely unfamiliar with the area. After a minute or two of this, he grabbed my arm and my elbow while I kept insisting how fun it would be. After a minute or two of this, he grabbed my arm around my elbow while he kept insisting how fun it would be. I tried to slide my arm out of his grasp, not super aggressively, but just to signify that I was not about this, but he tightened his hold. What he was doing wasn't overtly aggressive either. It was just like he was trying really hard to convince me. But then he put his other hand on the small of my back and just held it there and told me he lived just a couple of blocks down and that he could show me a really good time. We could smoke, uh, put on some music, whatever. Without removing either hand, he started to lead me out of the alley entrance and down the street in the opposite direction I had just come from. By now I was totally flipping shit internally. And even though I was trying my best not to let it show, my voice was quivering a bit when I had... My voice was quivering a bit when I asked him to please take his hands off me and that I needed to get home. Without removing either hand, he just laughed and kept me moving. His laugh was disgusting. I was scanning the street for someone to try to flag down for help, but didn't see anyone up ahead. He just kept muttering, and now more to himself than to me. What a good time we would have, and how I was such a cute little girl. After about a block, when his hand slid a bit lower, I finally snapped out of my daze and started to struggle. I now yelled at him to let me go and tried to push him off of me. He resisted me, and he tried to pull me into the shadows of the storefront we were just standing in front of, out of the way of the streetlights, and kept telling me, now angrily, but not yelling to be a good girl. In the midst of this, he had me held tightly, and he pulled my body against his. This felt like an eternity, but it couldn't have been more than a couple of seconds before I was somehow able to push him, elbow him, knee him, whatever I could do, and break free. As soon as I was out of his grasp, I started to bolt back in the opposite direction, and heard him yelling out all sorts of colorful names behind me. I didn't look back for what felt like forever, and when I finally did, I was relieved that he wasn't following me. That didn't stop me from running another few blocks, until I was completely out of breath and near hysterical. I called one of my co-workers and could barely get the story out between sobs, and he was insistent upon me going to the nearest open store, it was McDonald's, and waiting for him to meet me there. I sat away from the windows, but got my eyes locked on the door as best I could from where I was sitting. Terrified that the creep had somehow seen me walk in, the person I called and another male co-worker were there in less than ten minutes, and they walked me all the way back to my hotel room door. I was still completely rattled, so they called yet another co-worker to get in on my drama and she came and spent the night in my room with me, 
All three of them urged me to call the police, but I just didn't want to deal with it. I just wanted to put it behind me and get out of the rest of the week. Honestly, though, a month later, it's still not entirely behind me. I know it was a very close call, but I keep thinking about the next close call that could always be right around the corner. Fuck that guy for making me feel so entirely unsafe and insecure. I joined Reddit today pretty much to tell a story, though I'm a lurker on a ton of subreddits, so it's just nice to have an account now. I've told the story to my roommates, who are from the same town, and I've talked about it a few times with some of the people who were there, but that's it. I don't even like to talk about it, because inevitably someone will say, Really? We should go try and find it again. I don't really want to. I looked for it on the map a few times, but I can't find it. Though my male friend who drove there that night swears he has the directions memorized through Google's aerial maps. Anyway, I'm originally from a major city in southern Ohio, and outside of town, there are a number of smaller townships. One of these is known as the more country bumpkin, redneck, grit part of town. It's not even in the same county, but it is part of the general area my city is thought of as. In the woods, there's this legend of Hell's Church that burned down by a ritual. Depending on who you ask, there are a number of Hell's Church myths in Ohio and many different places, but this one was closest to us and a number of my guy friends decided they wanted to be ghost hunters and check out haunted places around where we lived. We were juniors in high school, and while all of us obviously thought this was just stupid bullshit, we thought it was funny to go out and scare ourselves. Plus most people had cars or driver's license by now, so we were enjoying a new burst of freedom. I'm a scaredy cat about most stuff like this, but I was the most tomboyish girl in the group and always kind of wanted to be able to hang with the guys. Plus some of the girls in the group, who I was closer to, were going, so I didn't want to look like a loser or a pussy. So one day in November, we decided we were going to go out one night and try and find this church. We would actually been to this location once before, that fall actually, but one of my friends had a curfew, so after exploring an old barn and the railroad tracks and a bridge nearby, we left. We hadn't found the church, supposedly just a chimney at this point. To our disappointment and my mild relief, we took two cars out there, going past more populous parts of our city and back to this woodsy area. I can't honestly tell you how we got out there, but I know it's off a state highway, then an abandoned access road, past some old warehouse, and then down a dirt road. Once you get down the dirt road, there's a kind of thicker part of the road early on where we park cars off of the shoulder. We did this because the road thins out and becomes impossible to drive down. And also, someone clearly owns this land. And later down the road, there is some no trespassing signage. I'm sure a ton of kids come back here, so it didn't seem odd to me that they wanted to block this place off. I barely thought twice about it at the time. We get out of our cars and start walking down the dirt road, wandering off the path from time to time to check out barns or clearings where we thought the chimney might be. At first, it was just scary because it was dark and old or whatever, but then the barns started to get weirder like they were filled with weird spray painting symbols and bullshit. But that's not what bothered us. We figured whoever was there before us did it, which I still 100% believe, but also other stuff, like dead owls that looked like they had been opened up, though they were dried out and decomposed by the time we got there, thank God, and other bits that looked like they might have come from animals. I was grossed out, but we all kind of agreed that these probably came from the same teenagers trying to fake a satanic ritual, or that the animals got trapped in the falling apart barn and died in there, to be picked apart by other animals. My friends are now hardcore trying to find this stupid chimney, so they keep taking off through the trees into clearings. Myself and the two other girls were there kind of hanging back on the tree line for most of them, getting a little more nervous and a little irritated with all the coming up empty. As we keep going, we find a bike on the tree line, like a bike that maybe a 12 year old would ride. That's a little creepy, but fine, whatever. 
probably belonged to someone who owned that land. We decide we are going to go a little further, and soon enough, we find another bike. This one is older and a little rusted, but still undersized. We didn't talk too much about the other bike, just kind of mumbling that it's probably still nothing. One or two of the four guys who were there were kind of trying to pump it up, saying, these kids probably get murdered, or stuff like that, but no one is really having it. By this point, we've been here for about two hours, and it's getting really late, plus I think we were all a little more creeped out than we wanted to admit. We decide to head back to the cars, and I'm feeling relieved, happy to be headed back to my house and the fuck out of here. But things never work out that way. By the cars, we see a road that goes straight up a hill through the trees. At the start of it, there's a big metal gate that had a road closed sign on it, which we had seen before, but for some reason, it had never occurred to us to try and go up the road. We had a small debate at the gate, about an evenish split on who wanted to venture up it and who didn't. I absolutely didn't, but eventually we decide we'll go up there just to see. Both of the drivers want to go, so there's not a lot we can do about it. We climb over the gate and start up the hill, where an old pavement road is cracked and crumbled under our feet, though it was for sure a real asphalt road at some point. In addition to the road condition and the brush being an obstacle, someone had put a bunch of trees over the path, purposely blocking off the road for many cars, some of us starting to seriously question if we should be doing this, arguing that someone obviously wanted to keep us out of there. But we get teased for being afraid and keep going. I couldn't see where the road would end because it was so dark. We had a few flashlights, but it wasn't doing us much good, and the trees made it hard to see. Plus, the road was super steep, so all you could really see was up, with a little moonlight peeking through the trees. All of a sudden, we reach the end. The trees just open up, and we have come off of the incline to a flat field. And holy fuck, what a sight it was. It's the flat field with tall prairie grass on either side, probably two to three feet high, and pretty uniform. The path we are on splits the large clearing we are in down the center and leads through the grass to a cul-de-sac with three buildings. Two look like they are farmhouses with one varnished building. They were wood and while they may have been painted at one point, they look like they had been mostly weathered and stripped by time. I see this and I am done. I want to leave, but of course, some of my friends said that we have to check out these buildings. At this point, I finally put down my foot and as do the other two girls, and one of our guy friends, who decided this is enough for him. He was our valedictorian, so maybe he was just smarter. So the three guys who want to go to the buildings tell us just to wait there, and while we don't have to be in this field, out in the open, we decide we just can't leave them. At this point, we've turned off our flashlights, because the moonlight is so strong. The three of them take off down the little path, and the four of us who remain standing together bitching about how stupid our friends are, and making small talk. None of us say it, but we are all looking to the grass every now and again, worried something is going to jump out. It's just so creepy. It's a banded little settlement. It feels like our friends are gone forever. We see them get to a building and go inside. It was unlocked, I guess. We can see the flicker of their flashlights in the windows, and I just remember feeling so tense. It was like watching a horror movie in real life. After maybe about 10 minutes, though it could have been just a tense five, we see our guy friends coming towards us, lightly jogging, looking afraid for the first time all night. You idiots went inside? I said, pissed off at them. One of my friends just looks at us, and I'll never forget it. It... It was full of bikes. Just bikes, change of the walls. We didn't believe them. We kept waiting for them to say they were kidding. But they insisted, said it was like they were just storing a bunch of bikes there, most of them smaller. They looked afraid, and as much as I didn't want to bleed them, I did. They aren't the type of guys who pull a prank for this long. By then, we can all agree we need to get the fuck out of there, and we start down the hill, hurrying the best we can. All of a sudden, about halfway down the field, we see a car's headlights down the hill, about where our cars are. 
We see them pass slowly, and we know someone is down there looking for us. Because it's so far off the beaten path, we figure it's one of two things. The cops, and we are going to be fucked for trespassing. The people who own the land, or these houses, or something, and they are going to A. Call the cops, or B. Murder us. We know that road isn't that long, so they'll be turning around, circling back soon enough. And because our cars are there, they'll probably wait for us. We are all whispering about this as we pick up the pace, sprinting down the hill as fast as we can. I'm not a good runner, but I was hauling ass, getting down as fast as I could, basically hurtling over the fallen trees. Once we get down the hill, we don't see any headlights, but we know they can't be far away. Get in the fucking cars, one of our friends yells, and we are fumbling with the doors like a horror movie, just too nervous to get into the cars. We get in, and just as we start the cars up, we see the headlights speeding down the road, a giant black truck roaring up behind us. The truck seemed larger than life, raised up off the ground. The whole thing was terrifying, but extra terrifying was that we couldn't see who was driving in the dark, and with the headlights blinding us. We peel out of there, total pedal to the metal. The truck is still following us, bearing down on us as our two cars race out of there. The car is also getting really close to us, threateningly close, almost like it was trying to run us off the road. We're all screaming, looking back at the truck, fighting for some distance. Once we get to the highway, we are switching lanes, trying to escape. Luckily, we were in sedans, so it was easier for us to weave in and out of cars. But this truck is still chasing us. We are in two different lanes, but don't want to get too separated from our friends. The passengers of both cars are texting back and forth, trying to make a plan. It took us about 15 minutes to lose the truck. I'm not sure if the distance was too much, or if they turned around, but once we got to a big shopping center area, we ducked off the road and into a sonic parking lot. We all sat in our cars for a little bit, watching, to make sure we weren't going to get snuck up on, before getting out of the car to get some food and talk. Everyone, even the guys who tried to act tough the whole time, were pretty shaken up. It took us a while to settle down enough to head home. As much as we talked it over, we just couldn't figure out what had happened. Eventually, we all went home, during what was a pretty silent car ride, exhaustion and lingering fear taking over. We didn't talk about it again for a long time, and we never called the police, which honestly, as an adult now, I feel like we should have. I don't think about it often, only during the fall really, but when I do think about it, I ask myself, who chased us? Why was that town abandoned? Who owned those bikes? And where are they now? I shall preface this following story with some relevant information. Some countries have an uncommon yet terrifying kidnapping problem, but instead of asking for ransom, the perpetrators murder their victims and harvest them for their organs in order to sell them on the black market. The buyers are typically wealthy, sickly people who would otherwise be unable to find donors. Back in the late 90s, I was around 10 years old and living in Moscow, Russia. One afternoon, I was in my grandmother's room watching the news on the television. It's not that I was watching the news to stay informed, it's that there was really nothing else to watch except for some awful Soviet-era shows. The news described a man the police were after. He was wanted for kidnapping children and harvesting their organs. A composite sketch of the man's face was shown. I grew bored, so I telephoned to my friend to go outside and play. And we did. As the sun was beginning to set, we were walking home. The path we took was shadowy, as it was through some trees between a few condominium buildings, with hot water pipes running parallel to the path. Our building was about 60 meters from where the trees cleared and the path ended. We were always cautious about our surroundings when we were outside, especially of other people, so it just came as a habit to look behind ourselves every once in a while. But something was making me really uneasy at the moment, so I looked behind me expecting to see something, and I did. Some man was behind us, maybe around 30 meters. I thought nothing of it, and looked to the front again. 
He seemed familiar for some reason. At that moment, I remember the composite sketch, and I was immediately gripped by fear. I glanced behind me again, and to my horror, the man was jogging towards us, closing the gap between us. I turned to my friend, but reasoned that if I panicked and just told him to run, he may have thought I was joking, or perhaps I didn't want to arouse the man's suspicion, thinking that if he noticed my intent to run, it would have given him enough time to accelerate to a full sprint. Without hesitation, I muttered to my friend, Someone is after us. On three, run to our building. I didn't give him time for a reaction, figuring that if he took it as a joke, then he would just think I was trying to get an early advantage in a race game, which would be ideal. One, two, three. We sprinted, never looking back. I prepared the keys and hoped that I could get open the triple doors in time. The first door we kicked open, as it was the only unlocked one. I unlocked the second door and slammed it shut behind me. I entered the passcode on the next door and stumbled into the building. We immediately laughed uncomfortably since it was both thrilling and scary, much like the times when we ran from a place where we caused mischief, and that's probably what security thought, as the guard didn't believe me. I looked out of the windows and I saw no trace of the man. Could it really have been the same man from the news? I've grown increasingly unnerved over the past three days, as I'm not sure how to explain what's been happening, but I'll do my best. Well, three days ago, my St. Bernard started whining to go outside. It was around 3 a.m. or so. Now, my girlfriend sleeps through it, so I'm the one who gets up and takes care of the dog. And we have four of them, too. I live on five acres of land in the Pacific Northwest region of the U.S. Now, for perspective... My house is in front of my property, and the acreage is all in the back. Now, we also have a normal-sized backyard, and then a barbed wire fence that separates the backyard from the large field. Now, the reason the barbed wire is there is so the coyotes and other predators cannot get into the yard and harm the dogs. And I have neighbors, although they're spread out pretty far from us. Now, back to my dog waking up. Now, she usually sleeps through the night with no problems, so it was a little strange, but nothing too weird. However, she did the same thing the next night as well. And this is when I started to pay a bit more attention. Now, the third night, I decided to go out with her on a leash. I wanted to make sure that she was only using this time outside to go to the bathroom instead of an excuse to go play in the yard at night. As soon as I opened the door, she was pulling on the leash towards our big field. Only when we got about 20 feet from the fence, she stopped and was just staring straight ahead towards the field. I, of course, then looked into the field to see what she might be staring at, but I couldn't see anything. After about three minutes of her just staring into the field, she started to growl, which she never does. I looked again and what I saw, what I saw was unnerving. I'll do my best to describe it, but I do apologize, it was quite dark. I looked into the field and saw what looked like a tall man dressed in an old fashioned jacket and top hat. It was shocking enough to see someone on my property at that time of night, but what really unnerved me was how he was moving. There was something off about it. First of all, he was walking towards me, but his steps were, they were weird, like a bride walking down the aisle at a wedding. Step, pause, step, pause. After about ten steps, he made a right turn and continued to follow the fence. He then made another right turn, you know? walking away from my fence. It seemed that he was walking in a big square pattern. Now, my first thought was that it was someone on drugs or drunk, but his movements were very deliberate and coordinated. Not at all like someone under the influence. 
and I didn't feel that that person was a threat. And so I took my dog inside. I didn't need her barking up a storm and waking up my girlfriend. I went back outside to try to talk to the man. Of course, there was no one there. So the next day, I went to all my neighbors and asked them about it. Uh, none of them owned a top hat like this person was wearing. They all thought it was creepy, but had no explanation. I think many of them thought I was under the influence. So that night, my dog started whining at 1.47 a.m., so outside we went. Sure enough, out in the field looked to be the same person, top hat and all, and that walk, step, pause, step, pause. I don't know what to do. I want to get this on video because I hate this feeling of everyone thinking I'm crazy. I haven't told my girlfriend yet, but this is really starting to get to me. Please help. A little over a year ago, I worked at a gas station. It was one of those 24-7 ones with a minimart in it, and I worked the evening shift between midday and midnight. Now, I saw and dealt with a lot of messed up things in that store, which just led me to roll my eyes when people were doing or saying something creepy, wrong, or aggressive. Hell, if I had a dollar for every time I was threatened with death, I could retire. One night, I was out in the store restocking shelves when one of the creepy regulars came in and started talking to me. He was a full druggy redneck. He would have been in his 50s and he was tweaking whilst hitting on me. By this point in working in that festering hellhole, I had just learned to deal with it. Don't ignore them, they get angry. Don't act interested, they get clingy and sure as hell do not agree to anything. He was saying some messed up stuff, something about what he wanted to do with me. I zoned in and out of what he was saying. It wasn't uncommon for him to ramble about perverted acts and other gross things. I tell him I have to get back behind the counter because my co-worker needs me to make coffee for a customer. He was a bit irritated, but said he would talk to me later and then left the shop. After making coffee, I had to restock drinks, but the day team hadn't emptied the trolley of boxes, so I, albeit begrudgingly, took out the boxes to the big bin. This bin is located around the side of the store. There are no cameras, and the people inside can't see out to it. That used to make me nervous, but I had been there longer than some of the people who had come through, and was used to the environment. As I was throwing the boxes in the bin, the tweaking guy from before comes up to me and grabbed my arm. I try to play it off like he's goofing around by laughing and saying something along the lines of, Hey Fred, I know you like me, but you can't get all touchy-feely on me, alright? The husband will get mad. Sounds like I wasn't trying much, but with people like him, it was best to remain friendly with his type. The last time someone was more firm with him, they got knocked out by his right hook, and I was the lucky girl who got to witness it and call the cops. So, this guy tightens his grip to a painful point and says in an angry voice, I told you I was going to have my way with you. By this point, I have stopped smiling and am now terrified. He shoved me against the bin and goes to unbuckle his belt, when, out of nowhere, glass smashed. One of my more favorite customers was across the road at the pub and had seen him go straight for me and knowing his reputation wanted to make sure nothing bad was happening. And when he saw what was happening, he smashed his bottle of beer over his head. The cops were called and I didn't see the guy again. As for the guy who saved my ass, so to speak, I gave him free coffee for a month. As for the boxes, I refused outright to take them out anymore. My co-worker did it instead. He traded me for cleaning the restrooms. Back in my early 20s, I moved to Melbourne to go to university. Because of some of my dodgy mates I knew from outside of my uni, 
I somehow wound up as the go-to guy for drugs with my classmates. I fucking hated the reputation, but maybe felt a little bit cool at the same time. Ecstasy and speed, mostly. I was at the bottom of the drug dealer food chain. The type of idiot who jacks the price up to ten a pill so he can make enough money to drink and party. I had no guilt of ripping these people off. They're mostly rich kids who lived with their parents and didn't have to have a job to support themselves through uni. Healing them drugs was so easy and non-threatening. A few years after I finished uni, I was working an office job that was boring and paid peanuts. By now, my friends and I had pretty much grown out of the desire to take drugs on weekends. Dinner parties with good food, good wine, and good conversations was more our idea of fun now. My drug dealing days had well and truly finished. Or so I thought. It was 11pm on a Tuesday night. I just got home from a draining day at work and I was so exhausted and in a bad mood. I planked myself on the couch and stared at the ceiling, trying to muster up the energy to get up and shower before bed. My phone started flashing and vibrating on the coffee table next to me. I looked at the caller ID and it was T-Bone, the nickname I had for a guy who I met at a festival years ago and, and ended up spending a bit of time with here and there. He was a huge, friendly, weed-smoking, acid-tripping hipster with an impressive beard. I hadn't spoken to this guy in well over a year, so when I saw his caller ID on my phone, I immediately thought, ah, <laughs> he needs drugs. I answered and we exchanged some pleasantries and then I could hear the tone in his voice change to that awkward, hey, could I ask you a favor? Tone. He wanted drugs. And lots of them. Two thousand dollars worth to be precise. When I asked him what specifically he wanted, he just said as many eckies and bags of speed as I can get. He laughed. This is way outside of my comfort zone. Even when I was dealing back in uni, 10 pills was usually the maximum I would offer to anyone at a time. It was late. I was tired, but I was also broke. And figuring that I could clear an easy 500 after purchasing from one of my guys I used to buy from. Someone which T-Bone didn't need to know. I told T-Bone that I would call him back and see what I could do. To my surprise, the first person I called was Stover, and he was able to help me out, and he was only a five minute drive from me. We discussed the terms and conditions, which seemed reasonable. 60 E's and 30 grams of speed for about 1500. I called T-Bone, and he was happy to part with 2K for that amount. I met Stover out front of his luxurious apartment building. We had a quick chat, and he joked about wanting to meet the guy that I'm selling to. We shook hands, and I was on my way to T-Bone. I asked T-Bone where he wanted to meet, and told me where he was. I Google mapped the address, and it was a 45 minute drive for me. Had I known he was that far away, I would have agreed to sell him anything. But I couldn't back out now. The address he gave me was in what is probably the worst neighborhood in Australia. Known for its violent crimes, Murder and, of course, <laughs> drug dealers. <laughs> Irony. For anyone reading this living outside of Australia, they certainly don't show this shithole in the tourist brochures. I also won't mention the name of the place because I don't wish to offend anyone reading this that might live there. I started the journey. I now have plenty of time to think about how stupid I am. I had a ridiculously illegal amount of drugs on me. Driving into the roughest neighborhood in the country, after ages of sitting on the freeway, I took the exit and was approaching my destination. At this point I was so tired that I was in an almost dreamlike state. Every set of lights I pulled up to, people in cars next to me would give me greasy looks trying to act hard and start a confrontation. I pulled into the street where the house was. Your destination is on your left, my phone told me. My phone told me. 
The street was so dark because the streetlights were out and there was cloud cover, so no moon. I couldn't see shit. The houses in the street looked dilapidated and abandoned. This didn't feel right. The house that T-Bone said he was at had boarded up front windows with shitty graffiti tags on them and there wasn't any lights on. I called Tebow. No answer. <laughs> For fuck's sake. I redialed and thought it was about to ring out when he picked up. Hey Tebow, uh, I'm out front. <laughs> cool, come on in, he said. No, come out to the car, I replied. Hang on a sec, he said, and hung up. I was thinking, shit, I hardly know this guy. He had been at a few parties I went to, we hung out, but... I don't know anything about him. I saw him emerge from the side of the house, pushing through bushes that blocked the pathway. I was the only car parked on the street. He saw me and gestured for me to come over. I had no idea who he was with, so I thought it was time to get into character. I took my jacket off, so I was only wearing a white singlet, and put my 50 black trucker cap on that I kept in the glove box. I was hoping this would help me look a bit more don't fuck with me. My friends often joked about how I look tougher than I am. I have some football and kickball induced facial scars combined with a pretty large physique from smashing weights for years. I was big enough and scary looking enough to be intimidating. But truth be told, I'm really a fucking marshmallow who avoids confrontation. I shook hands with Tebow in the front yard of the place. I felt at ease when he gave me a happy greeting and thanked me for coming out this way. He told me to follow him and we went through the bushes around the back of the place. I could hear music. It sounds like they were pumping dubstep through shitty, distorted speakers. I could hear a few people's voices and I could smell cigarette smoke. Tebow ripped the back door open and the smell and sound hit me harder. I've been in some nasty house parties, but this was horrific. There were three of them in the kitchen. There was a flashlight attached by string to the twelve-foot ceiling, swinging back and forth slowly, pendulum style. This was the only lighting. The swinging light made it difficult to see the people in the kitchen, but with each sway I would catch a glimpse of their faces. They were absolute toothless junkies. All shirtless, skinny, with bad tattoos. We entered the kitchen and one of them closed the door behind us and stood in front of us, arms folded, as, as if he was guarding it. One of them came forward and told me his name was Jay. Not like he was introducing himself, it was more of a statement. His face was full-blown meth fucked. He sized me up and then Look at T-Bone and said, I thought he fucking said he was a fucking pussy cunt. T-Bone looked at him in total shock. As Jay turned to T-Bone, the flashlight swung past and I noticed he was holding a big screwdriver behind his back. Now I realized what was happening and I felt like an idiot. I've walked into a fucking ambush. Get a guy with a shitload of drugs to come around and rob him. Fuck. Jay turned back to me. He was about six feet away from me. He showed me the screwdriver and said, What have you got for me? With a big front teeth missing smile. The fact I was so tired and pissed off kind of worked for me. Because I didn't show I was shitting myself. I squared up to him and said in a no-nonsense tone, Give me the cash and I'll show you. To which Jay replied, Nah, cunt. Didn't Tebow tell you these are on tick, mate? On tick meaning I'll pay you later or never in this case. I looked at Tebow, who looked back at me and shook his head and mouthed, I'm sorry. Jay looked at me with such hatred. It looked as though he was in pain. Give us the fucking gear, cunt. 
If it wasn't so dark in the shithole, he could have easily seen my overinflated pocket where the drugs were stashed in an envelope. I looked at the guy in front of the door and as soon as our eyes met, he put his arm over the door handle, confirming that he wasn't going to let me leave. We all stood there, trading glances. The swinging light made everyone's shadows look like they were moving. Jay didn't like this. T-Bone broke the silence and said, Jay, chill the fuck out, I'll get the money. And left the kitchen. I thought he was going to bail on me. <laughs> Who the fuck has 20,000 in cash just lying around? Jay slowly came towards me, pointing the screwdriver at me. He said, in a raspy matter of fact tone, I'll fucking kill you. I do the fucking time fucking try me. <laughs> That's cute, I replied. Then the painful anger came back into his face. I've never seen anything like it. I slowly put my feet into a fighting stance to prepare myself for what was going to happen. T-Bone walked back in and said, Here's the cash. Which briefly diffused the situation. I did a quick count. It was 1700. <laughs> Close enough. I threw the envelope of gear to Jay and the door guard moved and I got the fuck out. T-Bone followed me and he tried to give me an apology. Man, I had no fucking idea this shit was going to happen. I I I'm so sorry. I just said, you owe me $300. And drove away. I never got the extra 300. And I never dealt trucks again. I also, thankfully, never met Jay again. I was 19, staying late at the college darkroom to develop some film for my photography class. The photography building, once a tobacco warehouse, was a dark, rickety hulk near some lonely railroad tracks in a little traveled part of campus. I finished developing my film close to midnight and headed out, nervous as always to be alone at night in a deserted part of town. It was dark. Several of the streetlights around the parking lot were out, and the few that remained were phoning it in, putting out a weak flickery light that did nothing to reassure me as I headed toward my car. I heard him before I saw him. A scrape of feet on asphalt, he said. Hey, can you do me a favor? I was startled and dropped my keys, and he mumbled an apology for scaring me. I noticed he was wearing a jogging suit and limping. What do you need? I said. He hobbled a step or two towards me. I think I sprained my ankle. Could you take me to the ER? The university hospital was a short distance down the road. I hesitated. The guy looked perfectly pleasant, and he did seem to be in pain. But I'd recently finished a book about serial killer Ted Bundy, who lured some of his victims by pretending to have a broken arm and asking for their help carrying books to his car. When they leaned over to put his stuff in the passenger seat of his Volkswagen bug, he knocked him unconscious with a crowbar and stuffed them inside. The scene played across my mind as I looked at the guy. It also occurred to me to wonder why the hell anyone would want to jog in this creepy part of town. I'm sorry, I can't do that, but I could call somebody for you. There's a phone in the photography building there. There's nobody to call. I just moved here. I don't really know anybody. Can't you just drive me? It's right down Limestone Avenue. He leaned against a car and winced as he reached down to rub at his ankle. I'll call you an ambulance, I offered. No! I can't afford that. I don't have health insurance. Can you just drive me? I'll pay you 20 bucks. There was something in the way he said this last bit. Something wrong. Like that exercise in my acting class where we had to recite Mary had a little lamb as though we were delivering a tragic monologue or a furious rant. There was a tone rising up that didn't quite match the words he was saying. A raw urgency that reached down inside me 
and hit the panic button hard. There was a moment of silence between us. I can't help you, I said. I'm leaving. I gripped my keys, slipping them between my fingers the way my mom had taught me, so I could use them as a weapon if he came at me. I kept my eyes on him, and I speed walked the last few feet to my car. He watched me drive away, still leaning against that car, a flat expression on his face. Away from the dark parking lot, driving through campus with my music turned up, the fear faded. I started to feel a little guilty for leaving the guy there, although I knew I'd done what my mom and dad would have wanted me to do. I was about to turn into my dorm parking lot when I realized I needed to pick up some stuff for breakfast the next morning. So I turned around and headed back in the direction I had come. About a minute down the road, my stomach clenched. There was a guy in a jogging suit running along the sidewalk. His ankle was perfectly fine. Later that summer, two students at my college were attacked by those same railroad tracks. The girl survived, but her boyfriend died. The man who attacked them was a serial killer, dubbed the railroad killer by the police. He murdered dozens of people across several states, most of them near railroad tracks. I didn't see his mugshot on TV until years later, but the picture broke me out in the same icy sweat I felt when I saw that guy running down the street. I can't be 100% positive, but my gut tells me that I escaped a serial killer that night. So for some context to this story, my friends and I were all around 14 to 15 years old during this encounter. We also lived abroad in Prague, the capital of the Czech Republic. We all attended an international school, and we were like family. This was five people, mind you, a very close-knit group. Our parents generally trusted us to go off on our own in the safer parts of Prague, mainly around our school. This is relevant later on. During the summertime, we would sometimes go out to the theme park instead of our usual haunts. Of course, our parents would often come, along with siblings, so we didn't do this too much. It was too difficult and very little alone time. But now I really understand why they always insisted on staying close and being together. On one of our visits to the theme park in late August, one of our friends, Emma, met a native guy a year older than her. Let's call him Alex. She had the best check out of all of us, so she could easily communicate. They seemed to click and exchange phone numbers so they could communicate with each other in the future. Immediately, I got a bad vibe coming from this guy. He certainly didn't look 16, and he had the creeper eyes running all over her body. When we eventually walked back to our parents, I tugged on her arm and suggested that she deleted his phone number because of the creepy aura he seemed to have. And my best friends would often protect me the most if we were ever in a bad situation. I was somewhat naive at this time, which really didn't help my case. Emma snorted at my suggestion and told me that I was just being paranoid, though I still had this uneasy feeling. While Emma talked about him while we were waiting in line of one of the rides, Mackenzie, without a doubt the one I was closest with, noticed and asked me what was wrong while we sat together. Explaining my unease about Alex and his flimsy facade of a teenage guy, Mackenzie thankfully took my concerns seriously and helped me voice them to Emma, Chloe, and Camille. Emma and Chloe thought we were being stupid, while Camille was conflicted. In hindsight, they probably thought that the scary stories told about girls being sold into the sex trade were making us paranoid. We didn't get anywhere and eventually had to move on to the next ride. Mackenzie made Camille and I promise to help her keep an eye on Emma, but not to tell her because then she would get secretive and refuse to tell us anything. We agreed not to tell our parents unless things got out of hand because God knows the situation was tricky enough without our parents barging in and making it worse. This was the 14-15 year old mentality talking, which almost cost us. Emma and Alex talked all the time over the phone, and eventually started going on dates. She never told her parents about this, and would often cut lacrosse practice to go see him. This obviously bothered us, but it was impossible to get through that she needed her parents to meet him so she could stop cutting practice and hiding her relationship from them. 
After a while, Emma was talking about their first kiss, falling deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. Finally in mid-October, Emma left us on one of our tracks through the mall to meet Alex. Chloe was sick that day, and with no one to stop us, we decided to follow her and see where she was going to meet him. Following around 7 meters behind her, we watched her go to the edges of the city center and to a decrepit coffee shop. Alex and her sat outside and talked, occasionally stopping to sip coffee. They kissed a number of times, but Alex had an extremely eerie look, like he was driven more by lust instead of love. This brought Camille over to our side immediately. As up until this point, both she and Mackenzie are the only ones who hadn't seen Alex yet. We left, then returned to my house to set out a game plan for trying to convince Emma that Alex was a major creeper. Before we could even get started though, Emma called us to tell us about how she thought he was the one. After trying to convince her that she should tell her parents if they were really serious about each other, she blatantly refused and accused us of being jealous. We denied it and apologized, and eventually she hung up after inquiring about our homework for that weekend. At this point, we decided that the situation was dire enough to go to her parents. They seemed to be the only viable option left, but we were still terrified of breaking the friendship we had with Emma and Chloe. With the hope that Emma would still be out on her date with Alex, we dashed over to her home. Thankfully, her mother was home at the time with her younger brother. We quickly told her about what had been going on, and she seemed upset about it. However, we made her promise not to tell Emma that we had tattled. Instead, we proposed that it could have been found out by checking her phone records. Feeling better about having spilled the beans, we all returned to my house and hung out in my room until Mackenzie and Camille had to go home. The next day at school, we were confronted by a furious Emma and Chloe. They probably figured out that we had told on her and declared that they no longer wanted to be friends with us. I was crushed, but Camille and Mackenzie assured me that they would come around to our viewpoint eventually. I wasn't sure our friendship would ever be the same, but I tried to convince myself that we did the right thing. A couple of weeks later, while Camille was over at my house, I heard the doorbell ring. When I came to the door, it was Emma, Chloe, and Mackenzie. Their eyes looked reddish, like they had been crying. I immediately let them in. All five of us sat at my kitchen table, and Mackenzie explained to me what had happened. After Emma's parents intervened, Alex tried to contact Emma in other ways, often leaving a note in her window with a location of where they would meet. Emma and Chloe would organize it so that Emma's parents thought that she was at Chloe's house, while Emma would go out and meet Alex. This happened approximately three times in three to four weeks. On the second meeting, Alex convinced Emma that she should run away with him to his uncle's house in Moldova, a country to the west of Ukraine. On the third, Emma brought a bag full of clothes and such, under the pretense that she was sleeping over at Chloe's. Instead, she rode her bike to the train station and waited for Alex in a cafe near the train platforms. Apparently they had talked for a while, and he gave her a muffin that he had bought on the way there. Emma's father called Chloe's home minutes after she left on her bike to say that she had left her retainers and that he was going to drop them off later. But Chloe's mother told him that Emma wasn't coming over for a sleepover and that nothing had been scheduled. Remember when I said that we were like family? Well, our parents were close too and they trusted us enough to ask for confirmation from the friend instead of the parents at this point. Thankfully, Emma's dad knew enough to take the car off to the train station to look for her. He apparently saw her bike in the racks outside the train station. Before he could even go into the station itself, he saw Alex, along with two older men, walking into a gray van, carrying Emma. He ran at them, yelling, and caused a huge scene. They dropped her, ran into the gray van, and drove off. When Emma's father checked on her, it looked like she had been knocked out with sleeping medication. She was taken to the doctor's office to make sure she was alright. The police were called, and the whole thing was investigated. They never managed to track down Alex, 
but the police officers informed Emma's parents about teenage girls being groomed to be kidnapped and taken to other countries like Siberia or Russia and sold into the sex trade. I listened to all of this with Camille, horrified looks on her faces, and when Mackenzie finished, Emma started crying while she and Chloe apologized for not listening to us. We hugged it out and stayed at my house for several hours to reconnect. Since then, our friendship has never been stronger, and a strong unspoken policy has been enacted in our school to let the family meet the other half of the relationship. I don't think this experience will ever leave me, even if it didn't happen to me. If you get weird feelings about someone, don't hesitate to follow your gut instinct. There's always a reason to be afraid.